Welcome to this house of learning. This is your host, Christian M.C. Fulmer. This is Flourishing Schools, Part 2. England Church, also known as the Church of England, on DIE, Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity. The opening passage for this study is John chapter 10, verses 7 through 14, focusing on verse 10. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own sh the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep and am known of mine. Verse number 10 is, uh, well, strangely emphasized by both ACSI, the Association of Christian Schools International, and their partners, the Church of England Schools, in which part of their flourishing campaign, their flourishing program, or we want movement, whatever you want to call it, they emphasize what they note as John 10.10b, 10, in which says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly, although they change abundantly to fullness. We'll look more to that because that's just not some meager change in English language. That is delivery done in the, in, in the, in the grand scheme, indeed a scheme of things. And what's the first part of that scheme? Notice the first half that they leave out. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Be wary, people, of those who never bring up thieves, never bring up hirelings, never bring up wolves. Ever. Because they don't want you to be mindful or self-aware. And as you've noticed, there'll be no more text. It's a little time consuming. And as far as I'm concerned, anybody who wants to maintain their salt, who wants to draw closer to the Lord, if you want to listen well, if not preferably, have a Bible out in front of you, Texas with Receptus, especially King James, Geneva, right in front of you to follow along or read everything else and then some after I'm done. Please do so. Because unless you know, and that's, and that's the thing, this isn't just the Church of England or the ACSI. We also talk about Cardis from, from Canada as well. But that's really any church, any, or any ministry, any outreach, supposedly as so-called, that claim to be representing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if you don't know his word from Genesis to Revelation, you don't know his voice. And you can very easily fall for what anybody says. That's why it's important. That's why it's important of the priesthood of the brethren, as stated in the New Testament, made very clear. Every individual believer, every individual disciple of the Lord Savior Jesus Christ, every child of the Father of our Lord God needs to know his word so then they know his voice. Otherwise, you'll be following wolves, hirelings, and thieves all day, every day. So, the Anglican Church, or Church of England, will be referring to the Church of England from here on out on DIE. Remember this, I've heard this before, D.I.E. before, in that order, but I credit it to a good friend of mine who is an educator in, in Los Angeles County, who put in that order. 
he's rather comical so i wish you first heard it from, from from you know from him it would be so much more funnier if it wasn't so true anywho we're gonna be going over to the man himself andy wolf Let's listen to what he has to say and this and this took place during uh let's see here it was a uh, late 2020 early 21 i can't quite remember but a few years ago before flourishing to together was published and then he's and then we're going to be looking at a document that he that he refers to that still has relevance today still acts as one of the primary philosophical edu, you know philosophical if not a lot of those educational platforms of the church of england and support and supported by ACSI and Cardis. So we're talking about collaboration of thousands of private quote unquote Christian schools. And then we'll be looking at the we'll be looking at the five five of the twelve points talked about in that document. And we'll be following up with a commission, a committee, a meeting held by the Church of England emphasizing the last and final point they, this is a this is a long-term game and once again if you don't know your word well we're all free game except for those of us who know his voice and learn it more intently because let me tell you something most of the evil that is coming down the pipeline is an angel of light a lot of stuff that's put out in the media it's obvious stuff every heathen pagan every godless person even many of sodomites recognize it for what it is but no it's that of which looks like it's good but really it's not okay what was what do you think i'm talking about well here we are with uh andy wolf starting the first session actually introducing the flourishing paradigm and the fear is we we uh we go into a little bit into this talk i'll be having these links down below in the uh, in the description so you can watch them all live watch or listen to all of them yourself people in this in this day and age and it's only that worse because information is scarce good information genuine information unadulterated information is getting scarce I'm introducing to you the information. Intro. Meaning you won't get the full scripture, you won't get the full philosophy of man, the, the full actions and words of man unless you investigate yourself. Unless you know them personally yourself. Otherwise, what are you doing? You're just following me or just being entertained and as you can tell, I'm not that entertaining. We don't got time for, for that. Anywho, and yes, before we get started, I've been gone for quite some time. In a nutshell, car trouble, wife had to go to the hospital for a few days, and a few other miscellaneous items, which happened back to back all within about two and a half, three weeks. But you know what? The Lord is good. As you can see, Still got roof over my head, sh shoes on my feet, <laughs> clothes on my back, food on my plate. Still have the means of which to work and provide. And indeed, I still have the time and energy to do this. So you know what? I got no c complaints on my end. If anything, I should be taking advantage of my time and energy and resources, being generous with them as he's been with me. And I've noticed quite a peak of interest uh, as of late during my absence. So if you're edified by this, as in you, as in your mind, your soul is being, well, just given something of which that helps point to familiarize yourself with the way, the truth, and the life as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I've done my part. And as for and as as stated you know before, 
if you get to a, to a point where you outgrow me, because quite frankly, you're just far ahead in regards to the knowledge and understanding and wisdom of the things of our Lord, I say indeed, move on and go edify others. That is my expectation, because that is his by a long shot. Hey, blessed be the name of the Lord. Indeed, may there be mercy and forgiveness for such men as Andy Wolf, as well as any of those who've been working with him in spite of their error. May there be mercy, because after this life, there shall be none. There shall be none. Okay, let's move on. Just an introduction. He's just gonna just introduce this before we dive deep into this to, to this document to see what really we're looking at is not just the woke. The woke is a mere byproduct. No, no, let's 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 get to the let's get to the root. Let's get to the stem. Let's get to the actual evil tree. Oops. My bad. <laughs> Come on, wake up. Um, you'll be excited to know that Lynn and I have written this book, which takes this amazing uh, research that she and her colleagues did into flourishing, we've heard about in the opening keynote, and then tries to uh, add even greater depth to it and bring it alive in the practical application uh, for school leaders. And we're thrilled that that book is all uh, set to come out. You can jump on. Um, Amazon and order it now if you want um, and it's come and just as a reminder that that document in that book is what we well the, 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 the document is a summary of the book we went over the, that, that document the previous part one the book I don't recommend actually getting it but if you really want to find out firsthand just how much of the one world system it's just, I mean, really, I mean, really, I mean, it's, and we're talking about, we're talking about the, the full gamut of secular humanism, Eastern, I mean, if there's, I mean, if you really pay attention, especially to the sources, secular humanism, I mean, just the most hardcore psychology, and, you know, ever, ever, evolutionary worldviews, and New Age thought, Eastern, a little bit of Eastern mysticism, fair amount of Roman Catholicism, including uh, Jesuit theology as well, Society of Jesus, etc., etc. It's, it's there. It is there. It is, uh, this is a, this is a merger of everybody for the common good, as he'll describe much more so soon. But first, yeah, so, unless you're really purposeful about it, Look into it. Otherwise, just leave it. Just, just leave it be. We need to understand the relationship. Yeah. So, big thing right here is purpose. And he says that. Oh, yeah. Well, and he does say that all five of these. There's no hierarchy. But when you read the book, when you read the documents, the purpose, and even when you listen to this, the the purpose. You have, like, he says to himself, well, there's no hierarchy. No, no. But yet he emphasized, that's the thing about these people. They always talk about there's no hierarchies, there's no structure, there's no order. You know, it's just this, co it's just this coexistence, it's just this, it's just, it's just this, uh, you, know, you know, collaboration, you know, cooperation, you know, mumbo jump. No, it's, there is an order, there is a hierarchy, and the purpose is what defines everything else. Like I said, you watch, you, you read the documents, you watch these videos, it's, it's very apparent. I don't know why they're trying to make it seem like, you know, otherwise. ...of um, purpose to your work. But ultimately, what we need to be able to get to is a sense of the flourishing of adults and how crucial that is to the flourishing of children. There is no... By the way, the, the audio in these clips changes. It gets a little higher throughout, so if that's not me doubt that that is an integral part of our understanding of flourishing and without flourishing adults there will be very few flourishing children 
I don't know if you had to think around your staff team at the moment to think, well, how are our teachers flourishing? How are they thriving? How are they engaging with their work? How is their well-being? How is their creativity? How are their relationships? How is their purpose? And that Bear in mind, everything he's talking about was gone. The, the, uh, the premise of it is positive psychology. That's gone over in quite a bit of detail. There's quite a few sources in part one. So if you're wondering if he sounds... Like, oh, he's, being, he's skimming over quite a bit of this. Yeah, because it's already, it's already laid out quite a bit, especially in the book and whatnot. But yeah, it's all positive psychology, which in a nutshell is, if you know anything about Norman Vincent Peale, it's just mind over matter. Like I said, it's just Western, Eastern mysticism. Just, just, j j it's just flatlining everything. So then, so then long time, just wiring down, diluting everything. So then eventually it's like, oh, we just come together and just collective psychological nonsense where i mean they're not going to go that far they don't believe it most of them assuming hasn't shown any other indication of otherwise but you know it's, it's this it's this whole thing in regards to um you know just this collective consciousness element and it lends towards that it lends towards that very much like kabbalistic and talmudic judaism you know, like the higher mystical, especially like the Jesuit, you know, Catholicism, and even, and even the deeper, deeper as in you go look really look into the, look into the, the more mysterious traditions of Islam, etc., etc., native religion, Mormonism, it's all there. It's just, of course, a lot of the modern New Age stuff is just made up. You know, like it, it points to that sense of oh, we can all just come together and essentially replace or become as God. And the oh, just quick plug in. You just get an idea of what I'm talking about. There's a series 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 known as the Tribulation it's a, no it's a, it's, a, it's a tribulation quadrilogy. I'll put a link down to the first one. And you'll be surprised. I would recommend watching at least the first two. You'll be surprised. But these were made before 2000. These were made as 1999, 2000, 2000s. So 2000, 2001. So, so sorry, 98, 99, 2000, 2001. And they feature a lot of elements that are like on the nose today. And what he's talking about and what's happening in our mainstream culture, especially in technology. Sorry about that. Let's continue. Ecology of Flourishing is right at the heart of the book. And actually, Lynn and I will be unpacking this trio in our closing keynote for the conference later. Flourishing uh, children, flourishing students, flourishing educators, and flourishing schools. And when we think about our purpose, um, it's, a, it's a word that we use very um, easily, isn't it? You know, we, we, I'm sure we'd all be able to understand it. But it's interesting to look at how we've tried to define it in the book. So... I'm going to let him speak, listen carefully, and read carefully. And this might be a helpful way for you to think about it in terms of your teams. A perp our purpose is a clear understanding of our shared purpose. Our purpose is something we have together. It's not something that I have in one way, you have in a different way. Somebody sees it from a different angle. It's something that's shared. It's something that belongs together. It it explains why we are together at school. Why is it that we're doing what we're doing? And it sets us on the path to flourishing. Where you're confused or uncertain about your purpose, it is that much harder to um, move towards flourishing together. A common purpose helps us to be unified around clear goals and work towards a greater good to which we aspire together. And that's super important, isn't it? Super Okay, sounds reasonable, sounds legit, sounds commonsensical, blah, 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 blah. May sound biblical. But what are we talking about? What kind of purpose? What kind of unification? What do you mean by flourishing? Just because you hear something that sounds pleasant, and this is not, and I'm talking about for anything, even for things that are on your side of the aisle, you have to be very careful to know that, wait, 
what does this actually mean? What does this entail in the big picture? Don't, don't assume. Don't assume. Especially when people are making biblical references. Okay. Year by year by year, we're always on a, a work for an organization called the Church of England. Sorry, I'm mixed up a little bit. Common good. And I don't know whether you resonate with that um, kind of tension and that kind of relationship in terms of the kind of flourishing that we have in mind. But the idea of that vision that we wrote is to say that it is deeply grounded in a biblical worldview for the holistic flourishing of children. All right. So as you said, deeply grounded biblical worldview for the holistic flourishing of children. Bear in mind that holistic and flourishing are both a part of these positive psychology paradigm, which also in terms is a part of the, let's see here, I'm trying to remember, social emotional learning paradigm in private Christian circles. It's known as these social emotional spiritual paradigm. These are all underlying philosophies that give birth to what we know as woke. Evidence of that is, if you look at the Church of England, they've already accepted transgenderism. They've already accepted sodomy in general. They've basically already accepted the dictations and the definitions of the British government, which, which we all know is a very God-fearing political body. I'm not being facetious, I'm just, because let's face it, just look at any of the government, not, no less here in the United States of America, but I'm just making it clear, these people don't care about what Scripture, di about, you know, scripture you know, dictates. And you're seeing more of that soon. But yeah, it's a Christian worldview mixed in with human reasoning with human emotionalism, with human sensationalism, with human imagination, with, with basically just filth. You'll see, when we get into the, not this document, but the next one, you'll see what I mean, you know, in so, in so much detail. First, let's uh, move on ahead. But children from all backgrounds, from all contexts, from all settings, and for our schools to be a transformative, um, life-changing, life-enhancing experience for every community in our country. Deeply Christian, yet serving the common good. I don't know if you... Notice what he said. That, that was... There was a... That wasn't... When you listen to people... Now here's the thing. They say something once. Could be a slip of the tongue. Could be just... Because I do it every once in a while, too. But when they do it consistently and they say things of which, oh, wait, oh, second, that's what he actually meant. Deeply Christian. I don't know what the heck deeply in reference. I mean, if it's Christian, it's Christian. Are you deeply Christian? Are you deeply anything? But deeply Christian, yet serving the common good. Meaning what? That, like you said earlier, there's a tension. There's a contradiction. AKA there's things that are Christian, AKA biblical that don't quite go well with a humanistic, with a satanic approach. That's what humanism is. It's just a cult light. It doesn't, it doesn't go well. There's, there's, there's an issue. There's a conflict of interest. I resonate with that. And I can see people in the chat beginning to reflect a little bit on that, which is, which is great and loving that idea of flourishing. And what we sought to do in this document is to bring together some thinking about leadership and also pedagogy and also theology. I was actually really privileged to be part of the group that wrote this document. Um, the group was chaired by an amazing wise man called Professor David Ford. He's a David Ford, looking to David Ford, prominent theologian in the Church of England. He's also been, as of recently during this time, not too, too many years before, and even for a few years after. So currently, for the years surrounding this video, 
he's been a major player in what in ecumenism in in you know in interfaith dialogue where you would think okay you know the people of different religions and faiths that they talk to each other and learn about each other is like well that would be nice if that was the the max of what they did except the problem is is that oh no see we want to find our commonalities we can sort of serve the common good and ultimately all realize that we serve the same god if not we're all god to, to like together when it's all said and done so yeah that's that's david ford the uh, theology professor at cambridge university and author of many incredible um, new testament scholarship books um, and he uh, chaired the group and a bunch of us were also part of that in terms of understanding what our core purpose is, our why, not just our what. It's a clear vision for education in all schools, not just church schools. And that is a really interesting part of our international dialogues. So Z, it's for all schools, not just church schools. So, so we have this theology that's for all schools, including from other faiths or irreligious. And it's international, so it's for everybody. So think about it. It's something that everybody can use together. And we just, and they're supposed to, in the big scheme of things, do this together. Yeah, like I said, it is a gradual baby steps towards a one world. So especially when you're looking at the document and you look at the scripture references, and you're going to see how much they deviate from the sovereignty, from the supremacy, from the absoluteness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is what allows, well, essentially a true one world dictatorship to be possible. Like I said, read for yourself, listen for yourself. But for the time being, when we're working um, around the world with um, schools in uh, in all different countries. It's fascinating to see how our different systems have grown up together. I've just finished a really exciting project with schools across Australia, looking at how we can help them think about um, their core purpose. And in many ways, really resonant context, in many ways, a slightly different context. But it's all based around that promise of John 10.10 10 that Jesus makes. Notice what John 10.10 10 that Jesus makes, and he says what? Educating for life in all its fullness. Didn't say for life, educating for life in its fullness. You can imply that, perhaps, but not life in all its fullness for abundant life. And he makes a reference to what that abundant life is. It's not what these people are talking about. And it also leaves out verse half of 10, which is, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Why is that left out? I mean, it's not the only time. Matter of fact, the dogma we're going to look into that he refers to. In fact, let's skip on over to it. Because we're going to read all this in the document later because. Oh, wait, what was that? Oh, yeah, the leader. Yeah, that's so he just. Oh, get it. Kinks. Can't land on it. Anywho, yeah, leader's a dealer in hope. A dealer in hope. Anywho, so here's a quote from uh, Malcolm X. Sorry, <laughs> from Martin Luther King. I know who Malcolm X is, I promise. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X was just basically the Islamic equivalent. And then also another surprise figure, you would wonder why. An, English Christian would be referring to these two men, especially, well, considering the fact that Martin Luther King did not believe that Jesus was God. Anywho, I did a whole entire thing on on you know, on him and the civil rights movement inspired and, and more directly led by him quite some time ago. Yeah, there's there's literally like a speech he gave where he discusses the New World Order. I kid you not. Okay. Hope. We must access. Just got a few thoughts on hope. I'm not never. I'm never quite sure whether to quote Napoleon oh, God, in a Christian education context or not. But here, 
is an interesting quotation from uh, Napoleon. Yeah, see, look at that. You got an Englishman quoting a Frenchman who tried to take over Britain, who was a child and proponent of the French Revolution. Let's face it, I mean, without Napoleon, you know, the revolution, without the revolutionary ideals, principles would not have lasted into, into history. And uh, let's see, uh, not, really, not really too friendly towards God in general. So yeah, kind of awkward for you in so many ways to be referring to Napoleon when he makes these statements. A leader is a dealer in hope. I don't know if you've ever felt like that in terms of your work together, that sense of how do I sell a future that does not yet exist? It's well, because uh, I don't. I, you, how do you sell? A f they, they, they notice what he said. How do you sell a future? Sorry, I didn't mean to end with it. I hate it, I hate it when I accidentally end with people making people look bad. I mean, I'm not trying to mock them. That's just the nature of the beast. But yeah. Because I don't think these guys, I don't think these people are idiots. I don't think they're, you know, I think they're fools, perhaps. But that doesn't mean, you, that doesn't mean you're low IQ or a moron. If anything, if anything, let's face it, I mean, people with, people are more intelligent. And prone to, well, nonsense are actually just more dangerous. But anyway, they're just, it's just not worth mocking them. It's, it's, it's just, it's just ridiculous. It's like a, it's like looking at Joseph Stalin saying, "Oh, like, look at him. He's a, he's a, you know, just a, you know, retarded baby." And like, no, like, come on, really? Often, what visionary leaders have to do. This amazing quotation from Martin Luther King: "We must accept finite disappointment, but we must never lose infinite hope. We must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope." That's a Remember, doc, remember, Martin Luther King, I'm not going to call him a doctor, Martin Luther King did not believe in the, the deity of Jesus Christ. In fact, he supported internationalism and essentially wanted the South to become a, like, it's just a neo-North. Anywho. Christian understanding of hope. The gospel does not, Jesus doesn't come to say everything is okay. Everything will be perfect. You don't see any statistics that show Christians have, you know, a much easier time in life than any other. Well, if you, if you want to involve persecution, sure. But fun fact, these people don't ever talk about it and they shy away from it. Like every chance they get. We must never lose infinite. And I'm talking about mostly Christians from rest of the world, the United States, America, we haven't seen nothing yet, not even close. Hi. May your choice... Here's another second. Hey, look at that. See? There's Nelson Mandela. Yeah, when you look into the history of Nelson Man Mandela, it's like, wow, it wasn't quite what he thought he was, and he hated God. Choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. May your choices reflect your hopes, not your Fears. Well, hope in what? Nelson Mandela definitely wasn't for the good, for the good of the glory of, of God. I'll tell you that much. And then, lastly, this incredible verse from two Corinthians. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. So, since we have a hope, we are very bold. So he's referring to Second Corinthians chapter three. Notice he didn't really sh show it that long. It's, he's referring to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And it's notice that because we have a hope, we are very bold. Well, let's see. And, and mind you, these people, they use all different kinds of translations. Just to make sure that, because one of them is going to basically have the correct wording for what they're looking for to sell. To sell this future that doesn't exist. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. Sorry. I'm going to read 
first with verse 11 and go to yeah, let's back with it starting with verse 10 so second Corinthians chapter 3 remember he said verse 12 we're end on verse 12 maybe go to 13 just a little more context okay for first i start in verse 10 for even that which was made glorious had no glory in this in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth so god's glory exceeds exceeds our by like there's just no comparison or we're, 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 we're nothing anyways verse 11 for if that which is done away was glorious much more that which remaineth is glorious and whatever's left there's nothing that we do is left it all decays right so this is all talking about the glory of god verse verse 12 seeing then that we have such a hope so the, the hope is the eternal incorruptible work of god of our lord we use a great plainness of speech seeing then that we have such a hope in the lord we use a great plainness of speech you can read the whole chapter chapter three it's talking about the work of the lord particularly the spirit of the lord who was there at the beginning of creation And if you skip over to verse 18, sorry, first go to verse 17. What is this hope referring to? Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. What kind of liberty? But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So what's the hope? The work of the Lord, particularly spirit, and part of that work is transforming us into his image, the image of Christ, being as Christ. That is the hope. That is the hope. Strangely enough, once again, leaving out the whole aspect of beware of thieves. We want to steal, kill, and destroy. Let's see here, let's go over to... 36 last part with that time to reflect we are phrasing it for each who are rooted and established so now, about them um, through that in fact ask your students to ask their teachers to do exactly the same thing why are you even a teacher it makes a massive difference now, I'm a parent. I want my children to be taught by people who have a clear sense of purpose and are flourishing as a result. So what are we educating for? Crucial to that sense of flourishing. Once again, sounds great, right? Listen to, to the next thing. One of the pieces of work that I oversee in the UK is called the Church of England Foundation for Educational Leadership. And it's all about developing leaders um, who are equipped to work in our schools. And when we were trying to think about how we talked about leadership development, this was the, um, the, the mission statement that we came up with, um, which, which we really felt was resonant with our vision for leadership development. And it's all Church of England's foundation for educational leadership mission is to develop inspirational leaders who are called, connected, and committed to delivering the Church of England's vision for education. We'll be looking more into what called, connected, committed means. And here's the document that he's referring to. Connected and committed. And what we sought to do is um, articulate that in a core document, which we entitled Call, Connected, Committed. So look, at our core identity, this was done in 2020, is still pertinent today. Remember, you can look it up, Church of England, supports transgenderism sodomy and really in the long in the long term looking down the line it's going to be pedophilia pretty soon so that i wrote with professor david ford real privilege and um, to work with such a theologian and don't we start on usury and uh, and you know abortion slightly intimidating if i'm honest uh because he's such a super brain 
Um, but a real uh, amazing opportunity to work with him and share with him and understand his thinking and then to bring my own leadership development experience to it. And if you'd like to, um, you can see on the slide there the link um, to where that is located and you can just download it. There's no cost or anything. You can just jump on and have a look at that core document. So there you go. You can go look at it yourself. But for now, we're going to look at it quite a bit. Let's turn our attention over to window capture. All right, I'm going to get lost because there's no point of you looking at my face the, end of the entire time. Okay. So, welcome to Called, Connected, and Committed. 24 Leadership Practices for Educational Leaders by Andy Wolf and David R. Ford. Oh, look at that, David R. F. Ford. Sorry, David F. Ford. Like I said, look up David F. Ford. Ecumenist. One World Religion Nonsense. Okay. And there we go. The Church of England, Education Office, Foundation for Education Leadership. Let's go to contents. And I already highlighted some things along the way. So this is what we're going to be focusing on. So we're looking a little bit at the introduction. Leadership practice matrix is just a visual. Leadership practice scripters is just summaries of number four. We're gonna look over we're gonna look over ten of the twenty-four points. So we're gonna look over four point one, leading learning, refining judgment. Each of these is, is a point. We're gonna look at four point four, developing imagination, nurturing ambition. 4.7, removing disadvantage, seeking reconciliation. 4.10, celebrating diversity, enabling flourishing. They put these together, by the way, for a reason. It's not just random. 4.12, practicing humility, learning love. I got something to show you, emphasizing how important this last one is, learning love. It's for the Church of England, particularly in education. Now, why did I choose these five sets? Well, to keep up with the theme of diversity, inclusion, and, and, and equity, and quite frankly, like I said, we're starting with the, with the introductory point, the concluding point, and three in between. You'll get plenty of plenty of content, plenty of uh, their theology to really just show you that how well dubious at best the rest is. And here is the opening statement which really is the theme for this whole document. Educating for life in all its fullness is the goal of our Church of England vision for education. Deeply Christian serving the common good, or as Andy Wolf says, deeply Christian, yet serving the common good. So, you'll note the contradictions pretty soon. Okay. So let's see here, let's go over to opening set is, so we read the opening statement, and what does that mean? Well, at the heart of our vision is a search for a wisdom that rings true both with the biblical and Christian understanding, sorry, with the Bible and Christian understanding. The Bible and Christian understanding. Bear in mind, that's all different kinds of Christian understanding, including those who are obviously heretical, if not truly really Christian, including Unitarianism. Keep that in mind. And with experienced educational practice in the 21st century, the vision gives a distillation of, of, of that wisdom, and we offer it as a resource for anyone involved in education. For those who in various ways identify with Christian faith and practice, we hope it can open up further dimensions and depths for others, we hope that it can stimulate their thinking and educational practice and encourage them to respond by bringing their own understanding into conversations with ours. You know, which is a callback to one of the primary missions of David F. Ford. All right, the heart of educational purpose is these three things. Called, inspiring the, the vocation of the education leader. Connected, enabling the flourishing of children, adults, teams, and communities. Committed, sustaining long-term engagement in realizing this vision for education. 
We are extremely grateful to Professor David Ford, who chaired the original working group that wrote the, the Church of England vision for education in 2016. And 2016, people, and this document that we're looking at now is 2020. Just saying, seems like it was a... This is a very structured, not that really coincidental thing. I'm just saying. Just saying. All right, anyway, and you'll see what I mean when they start referring to uh, current events later on. Okay. Overseas, and then, of course, Andy Wolf, who, as Deputy Chief Education Officer, Leadership Development, oversees all the Church of England Foundation for Educational Leadership's programs, networks, and research. In direct partnership with ACSI of America and CARDIS of Canada, so they have reached around to millions, directly millions, of K through 12 through 12 students around the world in a quote unquote Christian context. Okay. In the introduction, like the vision for education, these leadership practices have deep roots both in the Bible, Christian wisdom, and in educational experience. Once again, not necessarily Christian or biblical educational spirits, by the way. And notice how they keep separating the Bible and Christian wisdom. Why? Because there's this recognition that there's a difference between what the Bible says and how people decide to interpret it, aka let's just ignore it for the time being. Because remember, it's deeply Christian, yet serving the common good. And have been, sorry, continuing, and have been matured in conversation with a range of religious and non-religious traditions and educational approaches. In the context of this diversity, we want each to be able to draw on their depths and riches in relation to education and to bring these into conversation with others in order to contribute to ongoing discussion and negotiation of educational policy and practice. If that is to be of high quality, each needs to sound their own depths and articulate them in relevant educational terms. So mind you, is there any intent on conversion, because after all, Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. He is the door to salvation. Of course not, because that would be um, that would be a, I don't know, being a faithful sheep. Anyway, let's see here. Going on to rest, of, rest we have uh, the Bible is not only passionate about the importance of wisdom, hope community and dignity in the flourishing of human life and of the whole creation it also refers to what going on to the other side responsible leadership is a blessing so it's talking about leadership that's what it's going to refer to so in conclusion responsible leadership is a blessing to many and is resourced by being itself part of an ecology of blessing as god continually blesses us and all creation we and the rest of creation bless God, and we are invited and enabled to bless each other, as Jesus blessed the children brought to him, and they refer to Luke chapter 18, verse 16. This is what I mean. You, so this is the first verse, the first verse reference. So God blesses us, all creation blesses him, we can all bless each other, and that's what Luke chapter 18, verse 16 talks about, right? Uh, not quite. Not quite, because see, God's um, God's ways aren't that diverse. They're not inclusive in the sense that he'll let, just let anybody decide what they believe and what they want to do. And it's not equitable as in it's just going to allow error, going to allow falsehood, going to allow just complete lies and deception to have its way. You'll see what I mean pretty soon. Like I said, if you have a Bible, follow along, read this all later, and then some. Luke chapter 18, verse 16. It says, I'm going to read 15. I'm going to start with 15 first, though. But remember, 16 is the emphasis. And they brought unto him also infants, that he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not. 
for of such is the kingdom of God. So don't let them, I want to, so I sing, I'm going to bless them. Don't let, you know, don't prevent them from coming to me. Such is the kingdom of God. And he explains that very next few verses. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, a lot of people will jump on and say, Oh, look, so this is the, this is the rich man who wouldn't sell everything that he had to the, to, the, to the poor. And then Jesus says, And thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and, and come follow me. But he didn't. So see, that, that there you go. Like, that feeds into the whole... Well, we need, we need to be equitable. We need to, like, this rich person needs to be a better servant. And, like, except there's a problem here. That's, it's not just about the money, people. It's about mammon. It's about worldly riches, worldly influence, worldly desires. As evidence of that, they ask, well, who then can be saved? It's so hard for a rich person to be saved. Verse 27 onward, and he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And Peter said, lo, we have left all and followed thee. Verse 29, and he said unto them, verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in the present time and the world to come life everlasting. So not talking about this world, next, the world next. The Lord will provide your needs. And then some, of course, be generous with, with that then some. But your hope is not here. The hope is later, because after all, life here is short. Our life is but a vapor. But first and foremost... For going to verse 6, verse 17, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall no wise enter therein. So, does that sound like what they're promoting so far as a church of England? Afraid not, people, afraid not. The thief cometh but to steal, kill, and destroy. And what is that? Well, the blessed hope. What is that? Well, being in the presence of the good shepherd so that they may enter so they may enter into his kingdom so they distract him with what the common good they sell they sell them a future that doesn't exist or never will <laughs> in this case okay let's see here called so you can read the whole thing yourself, but the emphasis here is, for some, this sense of vocation will be driven by an established or developing faith commitment. For some. So this calling, this vocation, for some, as the Church of England says, for some, this sense of vocation will be driven by an established or developing faith commitment. For some. They don't even care if it's, oh yeah, who, see, who cares about their souls? Who cares about whether well, they have faith? In anything for that matter <laughs> that's irrelevant connected leaders who are connected operate deliberately within communities of practice look up the term community of practice i've gone over this before that is a part of the internationalist globalist ecumenical whatever you want to call it one world movement one world system that is not from the church that is everything to do, everything to do with the schemes of Satan in becoming the head of humanity, you know, this collective godhood. Look at, look it up, communities of practice, like you'll see from it, it's, it's just hardcore, you know, it's hardcore, like I said, you know, forget woke. Woke is just the natural byproduct outgrowth of this. Are committed. They are committed. So in conclusion, what are what are educators committed to? They are committed to the flourishing of their pupils and colleagues. Well, what kind of flourishing are we talking about? That is what we're going to look into. 
that is what we're going to look into. Thank you very much indeed for still listening and learning with me. Thank you for your prayers. I much appreciate it. It's been a blessing to me, by all means. Prayers go a lot longer than the American dollar or any other form of currency there, you know, therein. So please keep on praying. That's what keeps the ministry, the outreach going. All right. Number four, our Christian inspiration reflections on 24 leadership practices. We're going to look over 10 of them because they come in sets of two. All right, 4.1, leading learning, refining judgment. Leaders of learning need to be resourced by deep wisdom. Notice whenever people, like I said, like I said, the whole thing about, well, you know, there's social justice and the common good. You know, oh, now there's deep wisdom or deeply Christian. Like, if you already got a term that already has significance in of itself and you have to add an adjective to it, that's a Ponzi scheme as far as I'm concerned. Like for instance, there's grace, there's mercy, there's sanctification, there's salvation, there's sacrifice, etc., etc., long suffering. You know, it's like these, you don't need to add an adjective to it to make it significant, to actually make it hold water. That's just, that's just man, that's just, that's just Satan being inspired by Satan to create something of which has no meaning and has no substance to it for his own personal well boogaloo I'm just going to use the term boogaloo why because in, in, in the end it's all nonsense all right it's just a show people it's a show it's fake it's, it's pretend all right so here's the thing what's what's all this so lead so leading learning so how does learning begin wonder is the beginning of wisdom Curiosity, intrigue, and the joy of discovery are at the heart of the spirit of learning that inspires good teaching. So yeah. Wonder. Ah, oh, like, ah, oh, like, does that sound, okay, look, remember, Lord said, come to me with the faith of a child. As in, you're going to believe the things I say because you recognize that, like, for instance, when I was, when I got saved at the age of eight, I recognized that, okay, I am not good. People are not good. It seems like we can do good, but in the big, but if we're big, honest picture, the you know, really from what I've observed in life, you know, especially with media and everything. I mean, let's face it. I mean, we, we can't exactly say, oh yeah, we're good people. Yeah, we love watching violence and perversion. We love people, watching people get you know get you know get hurt if not maimed and murdered. Like, how does, I'm sorry, but that's just, I don't know, to me it's like, what? <laughs> Amongst other things, but he's like, I concluded, okay, we're not good, we can do good, but we're not good, no less me, but God is good. So I'm going to follow God. And yes, I, I, there's a lot more I didn't understand, a lot more I could have learned, but I understood a pretty foundational thing. As opposed to, you'll see, this is, I mean, sounds great. Oh, yeah, it sounds great. You have wonder, curiosity. Uh, all right, let's see here. Except, once again, how they use scripture, and this will give you a pretty good idea of what they're talking about. So, the Bible personifies wisdom as involved with God in creation and gives her a voice. So, this is what it says. I was beside him like a little child, and I was daily a delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the human race. Proverbs 8, 30-31. Once again, I don't understand what translation they're using. This is why you always stick to the one that's um, not bound by copyright law. So King James and Geneva, anything similar from that time period, I'd say it's one, that's one reason why it's my go-to, because it's, it's free. <laughs> it's... Yeah. It's free and it's far removed from from our culture to a point where it's like, okay, this is saying things that not only would we never endorse, but we would be embarrassed by not because um we don't like it, but because it makes us look like sociopaths. 
So Proverbs 8, 30 through 31. As stated in reference to wisdom. It says, Then I was by him, as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with, were with, the sons of men. Not my delight, not, and delighting in the human race, no, no. And my delights were with sons of men. In other words, um, it kind of puts us in our place more so. And just to further prove my point, verse 32 through 36. Now therefore hearken unto me, O ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. Hear instruction, and be wise, and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. For whoso findeth me findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. That's Proverbs chapter 8, verses 30 through 36. All they that hate me, as in wisdom, love death. And I don't know, like, human experience, past and current, and it lends, lends a lot of testimony, a lot of evidence to that statement. And then there's also, look, scroll down below here, to, says here, on top of Deuteronomy 6, 1-7 highlighted, transmission of knowledge and sharing of wisdom across the generations was central to the identity of ancient Israel as it has continued to be in Judaism to this day. Unfortunately, Judaism today includes the uh, Kabbalah and the Talmud, which are extra-biblical and godless doctrines and, 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 the, and you know, traditions of men. Well, let's see here. It says, Transmission of knowledge and sharing of wisdom across generations was central to the identity of ancient Israel. So, read through all this, and you'll notice it seems pretty lofty, pretty like, oh, you know, it's like, oh yeah, this sounds like a good thing, and, but, you know, how serious are we talking about, especially in regards to, I don't know, reverence for, for the Lord? Look at Deuteronomy 6, 1-7. through Now, these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord our God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, that ye may increase mightily, as is the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, that the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt take them, talk of them, when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Etc., etc., etc. Parents are, are commanded to teach their children the word, so that they may know who? The Lord. So then when other men come and say, hey, this is what God says, and we're like, uh, no. No, that's, no. That may, res they may sound similar. That may have a hint of him, but, or some of them may know it so well. I'm like, I'm sorry, no, that's, you are clearly a thief. You are clearly a wolf. Get out of here. Away with you. Away with you, you bloodthirsty, greedy fool. All right. And that's thing, concluding this part, it says, Leading learning, it places children at the heart of all decision-making in the face of the immense challenges of competing demands and scarce resources. So from what I've read, in Proverbs 8:30 to 36 and Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 7, does that, does, from what I've read, from what they referenced, 
does that jive using a using a term from my from, from my parents childhood does that jive it places children at the heart so look to leading learning it places children at the heart of all decision making in the face of the immense challenges of competing demands and scarce resources and the answer is no because that is not fearing the lord or caring for his will at all at all you can't say it's god centered yet well yeah you put children at the center though like what it's biblically centered but children at their center yeah that's why we have transgenderism people that's why people don't know what they are that's why people that's that's why we we, we we let people who don't who, who shouldn't know who they are who are learning what they are to decide what they are that's just, amongst so many other things that's and think about it. that's why we agreed to oh yeah truth is whatever people want it to be and then we're upset when it turns out wrong yeah we all agreed for a while you know yeah yeah truth is whatever the individual person decides and then we're upset when it blows up destroys everything all right let's see here refining judgment As leaders refine their judgment, so their own character grows, formed in the crucible of the challenge. So we gotta go through challenges. We gotta go through, gotta go through difficulty. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta, you know, stretch beyond our comfort zone. Except, we gotta be careful with things like this, because yes, this is I'd say one of the things that for sure, because the Lord does speak of using these opportunities to discipline us or at the very least very least nurture us but thing is that in this setting not so much this is not how you refine judgment in fact psalm 63 let's once again using their own references this is why you gotta read your bibles people this is why you gotta read it yourself I mean, there's literally people quoting, quote, 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 the devil quotes scripture. The devil quotes scripture. He did it with Jesus, trying, well, tempting him in the desert. How did Jesus rebuke the devil? He knew the scripture. He knew the word. He is the word. He knew the word. So know the word. That's how you defeat the devil. That's how you don't fall for stupidity. That's how you don't fall for, you know, fall for like tricks, if not just other just utter traps you know the shepherd's voice All right psalm 63 let's read the whole thing focusing on verse 7 7 says because thou hast seen my help therefore in the shadow of thy wings will i rejoice therefore in the shadow of thy wings will i rejoice notice therefore in the shadow of thy wings it's not so much the challenge, not so much getting out of our comfort zone, it's the work of the Lord. And six, Psalm 63, and, you know, from start to finish, let's read. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee, my soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee, in a dry and thirsty land, where no water is, to see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life. Because thy loving kindness is better than life. Our life, people, our individual lives. My lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. Because thou hast been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword, they shall be a portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. Every one that sweareth by him shall glory. But the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped are you listening to what i just read and i hope you read it yourself and i hope you read it again 
So where does refining of judgment come from? In the shadow of the wings. And because of the blessed, that is the work, the eternal, holy, perfect work. Especially after Christ, that is the spirit of the Lord, where there is what? Liberty. The mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. So make sure you know you're listening to the truth. No less me, people. No less me. Okay, let's go on to 4.4. 4, developing imagination. Nurturing ambition. Wow. Nur developing imagination, nurturing ambition. When you read the scripture, what it says about imagination and ambition, uh, in a nutshell, uh, our imagination, stupid. Ambition, abomination. You can read it for yourself. I'm not going to do it now. Read it for yourself. But... Main point, imagination is at the heart of pedagogy. So our imagination is at the heart of pedagogy, as in how we educate. Great, that sounds wonderful, right? The common good based on the human imagination. Especially if it's the imagination of a child. Because remember, when the child has faith in God, he's listening to God. He's following Jesus, the Good Shepherd. As in the tr following the way, the truth, and the life. See, that's why it works. Because you're not just following your inex let's face it, I mean, your inexperienced and let's, I mean, darkened, faulty, emotional, and bleeding, like, and I'm talking about myself too. If I'm not centered on the word, I'm just doing whatever, like everybody else, and that's working out, right? All right, let's see here. So, looking over at developing imagination, says the imagination. According to Walter Brueggemann, the imagination must come before the implementation. Our culture is competent to implement almost anything and imagine almost nothing. It is our vocation to keep alive the, the ministry of imagination. As inspired by Isaiah chapter 43 verse 19, which according to them says, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it spring up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Yeah, this isn't just talking about just mere imagination, people. I mean, come on now. Once again, all this, just this is this is what we call in the in the old in the old church tradition levity, just making just making light of holy things, of sacred things, of of things of substance, things of the Lord, things of you know, of spiritual things. So Isaiah 43 chapter, sorry, Isaiah 43 verse 19, let's read 18 through 21. It says, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing, now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness, and rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the, in, the, in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. So he's referring to people. This new thing is going to give life unto people. This is in reference to the coming Messiah. Verses 22. But thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob. But thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. Thou hast not brought me the small cattle of thy burnt offerings. And it continues to say, and remember, these are honest, heartfelt, wholehearted offerings. Verse 24, Thou hast brought me no sweet cane with money, neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy offerings, but thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities. I even I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake, and will not remember thy sins. Remember, this is the book of Isaiah. This is speaking of the Lord God currently, in reference to the, the to Jesus Christ, the work of Jesus Christ. 
Put me in remembrance, let us plead together, declare thou that thou mayest be justified. Thy first father hath sinned, and thy teachers have transgressed, sorry, transgressed against me. So they've sinned, they've broken the law against me. Therefore I have profaned the princes of the sanctuary, and I have given Jacob to the curse, and Israel to reproaches. So here, they're emphasizing, oh, see, look, this is just showing the creativity of God, but it's referencing the desire for the Lord to forgive those who repent, those who reconcile with him. He desires to to, <laughs> to be in covenant with them, serving and following him in his righteousness. Going on. In this part, it says, The prophets do this in their context, and Jesus' ministry does the same. Reimagining the past, present, and future, God-centered imagination sometimes defies what currently seems plausible or realistic. And we're going to use Ephesians chapter 3, verses 18 through 21. Remember, these are all Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18 through 21. I'm not even going to go entertain that nonsense. Reimagining, yeah, that's that's it. Once again, that is a mainstream. Look, you can look it up. All this stuff is mainstream now, like talked about in in higher academia and politics, economics. It's just, it's just, yeah, it's just, yeah. We reimagine. We can just re, we can just redefine what things are, like God did. He just changed everything. And, and thus, we can do the same thing, because we're all children of God. We're all in his image. Like, remember, Martin Luther King believed we were all children of God. Thereby, we can all just collectively just do as we please, because if we're all in, if, if, if we're all consenting, we all consent together, then we can do it together. All right. In reference to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18 through 21, I'm just going to read it may be able to compromise okay actually you know let's start with verse 17 that makes gives a lot more it, it makes a lot more sense for me yeah it makes no sense if you start with verse 18 okay verse 17 that christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of christ which path is knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. So now you're being filled with all the fullness of God. And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with the fullness of God. To do what? Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. So the power of what? The Holy Spirit of the Lord. The work of the Lord. It's the work of the Lord that gives us the power to do this, to do what He wants us to do. Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Not this world. We're talking about, we're talking about another world. Not this world. This world is going to end and start over again. In eternal, reference to eternal life, doing the work of the Lord, being empowered by the Lord to do His work, to do His good, and to do what He desires, not what we want to do, what He desires to do, to serve Him and love Him and praise Him. Common good? No. To be deeply Christian is to not be scriptural, is to not be according to the will of God. Nurturing ambition. Human ambition is an abomination before, before the Lord. Look it up throughout Scripture. Now it says, What is ambition for? Leaders are tasked with nurturing expansive ambition, which includes excellence in key subjects, designing, designing curricula for social justice, loving the most vulnerable, broadening the definition of educational success. Broadening? You'll hear broadening a lot. Broadening, broadening is used a lot in flourishing. Broadening is used a lot here. There's a broadening of everything. Broadening the definition of educational success and flourishing and tenaciously removing barriers, including those relating to self-esteem. Barriers, including those relating to self-esteem. 
disability, attachment, support, resources, geography, economics for the children in, in their care. So, these are tasked with nurturing his expansive ambition. And they reference Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Now, this one right here gets me a little bit. I'll be honest. Because this, this chapter, this passage, has been abused so many times for the utter ridiculousness of men that I've noticed in the last year alone. This is what Philippians 2, 5 through 11 says. Does this sound like anything that they're, you know, describing? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. People love that part. People, they'll emphasize... People emphasize this passage up until like verse 7, very briefly, or just skip through verse 8, and become obedient to death, even the death of the cross. And 9 through 11 gets watered down significantly. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that jesus christ is lord to the glory of god the father there is nothing stated about that at all in this entire section and throughout the entire document the glory of god the worship of every knee shall bow that's where diversity comes in Every knee of every tongue and every nation, every ethnic group will bow down and worship Jesus Christ. Someone of every single group has and will. That is where the diversity comes. That's where the inclusion comes. That's where the equity comes in. There's no, diverg there's no diversity, inclusion, and equity in sin and evil and wickedness. By the way, you can look through this document. There are few to no direct substantive references to evil, to sin, to wickedness, nothing. Why? Because it's the common good, man. The common good. It's not man's not good. We just promote the common good. See? We can't even say we're good. We just say, oh yeah, the common good. We have a good that we share in common. It's not good, good, but it's you know, it's the common good. You know, it's, it's, it's imitation good, like imitation crab. It's not really the thing, but we believe it's the thing. All right, let's go to 4.7. Removing disadvantage, seeking reconciliation. Emphasis, they create and, and implement, meaning educators, leaders. Leaders in education create and implement a curriculum that liberates and empowers children and communities. Sounds great. Sounds wonderful. What do they actually mean? Is should always be the question at hand. Let's see here. Well, let's see here. It opens up learning experiences that may otherwise be unlikely, empowering children with what Professor Michael Young calls powerful knowledge. Well, not knowledge, powerful knowledge building cultural capital for the benefit of the whole community. It's a little bit late in reference, but he talks about, what is he, we're going to go to Luke chapter 14. Once again, they're references. And then you can be like, you're just cherry picking. There's, you're, you're skipping over a bunch. You're gonna, read them all. Go ahead. Read them all. Read them all and read the whole, read the whole section. Read everything around them. I want you to. And you'll see for yourself just how false this theology is. This is this is the doctrine of devils. Strong language, but hey, read it, read it all, and you'll see for yourself how far they deviate from what the word actually says. 
So Luke 14, 13. Let's start with verse 12. Then said he also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed. For they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Two things, and thou shalt be blessed. Why? Because they can't give back to you. For thou shalt be recompensed. You'll be rewarded for the good works of the Lord at the resurrection of the just. Once again, not this life, the next one, the eternal one, the one that actually matters, the one where we're perfected, the one that we're made completely, utterly new in the likeness of our Savior of our Lord, will reign over everyone and every knee shall bow. Verse 15, And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall be eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many. And he sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all these things are now ready. And of course, people make excuse. Not really. Read it for yourself. 17 through 21. And people make one excuse after one another for why they couldn't come. And the servant said, Lord, verse 22, the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. So, once again, calling in, calling the poor, the maimed, and the blind, etc. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges, and, co and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, to you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. And when you read the entire chapter and the one surrounding it, what is the supper? The gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life. To, be, to, to, to enter in the kingdom of heaven, to become a child of God, become a disciple of Jesus Christ, to receive eternal salvation, to be renewed to a new creature from the old. That is the supper. That is what they're being invited for. Meaning what? They have to accept it. These people are being invited. They're not being forced. They're not being told to. They're being invited. They're compelling them, they're pleading with them to come, but they have to accept their coming, they have to come in on their own. You know, this, this, you know, the Holy Spirit does something. I don't know how to explain it. At the age of eight, I accepted him. I can't explain to you why. <laughs> I told you what I thought, told you what I understood, but I did. But, but ultimately, there was no, there was no force that I, I can identify. I surrendered. <laughs> I surrendered all. Seeking reconciliation. What do they have to say about reconciliation? Reconciliation is the healing of broken, wounded, or distrustful relationships in honest recognition of past hurts. Our society has many such relationships at all levels, such as polarized politics, division centered on wealth, class and culture, ethnicity, religion, gender, age, family, health and disability, and conflicting responses to controversial issues such as the environmental crisis, immigration, or crime. Yeah, so that's what we need to reconcile for. Except, uh, is that what scripture says? Um, no. In fact, if you look carefully, there are no references on this page. But what did... You can look in the, in the book of Luke. When the angels came before the shepherds, the night of which Jesus was born, and they sang a song which entailed what? And it summarizes this reconciliation perfectly, and it's stated throughout Scripture. That first and foremost... That there is reconciliation between God 
and men. That men are reconciled to God. They turn from their rebellion. They turn from the deception. They turn from the death that is to be apart from him, to be against him. And they're reconciled unto him, and thus in the because they are truly reconciled to till their to their their, their, their fellow man. All of this in the yellow right here listed. Yeah, it's secondary. It's worldly stuff, doesn't matter in the long term. Because a person who's truly a soul, a man who's truly reconciled to the Lord, this is not hard to own up to. Anything that you're actually guilty, anybody who you actually offended, you actually wronged, not in this... Once again, this is the fruit, this is the byproduct of intersectionality and wokeism and whatever you want to call it. It's, 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 yeah, notice there's no scriptural references because the Bible does not, makes it very clear that reconciliation is between God and man. And why? Because God is good and man, well, not so much. That's the totality of it. Whether you like it or not, that's what it says. So either believe it or you don't. As you can tell, they don't believe it. 4.10, celebrating diversity, enabling flourishing. So look at that, celebrating diversity leads to the enabling of flourishing. But what kind of diversity are we talking about? Well, superficial if not sinful at best. Okay. Well, okay, superficial at best, sinful, when it's all said and done. Okay, so they take every opportunity to celebrate learning together, leaders in education, and hold their doors open to people from all backgrounds and traditions, which sounds great, right? Except the problem is, is that do these people have to uh, conform to, to the Lord? Not to a church, not to an organization, because that's the thing about... See, see, that's the thing about the one world system. That's the thing about denominationalism. That's the thing about the Roman Catholic Church, Mormonism, Islam, cults. That's the thing about secular humanism. That's the thing about statism. Is that you have to conform. Oh, and you know, revolutions, right wing or left wing, whatever. You have to conform to a political body, to a body of men. Whereas, with salvation, you're conforming to the Lord. That's why, throughout the ages, people did not want you to read the Holy Bible. Because then, it's easier to convince you, oh yeah, you just have to listen to us. Because we said so. And we have the, 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 the new revelation, and the deep this, and the common this and the social this, and the new this, and the new that. But no, when it's all said and done, you are conformed to the Lord, not men, the Lord. And thus you make sure you know his voice. Once again, look for yourself. Celebrating diversity. How do you celebrate diversity? Leaders should not seek diversity and inclusion just because it is the correct thing to do. We should pursue it and chase it down because it is inherently better. It's just inherently better. Remember, everybody together believing completely different things, but really we want them all to, you know, coexist, aka water down and sterilize everything for this common good. Yeah, that's... Think about that. We want diversity, but we want a common good. Hmm? Does, it, does that make sense to you? Does, it, does, does that not like sound like a scheme? Like selling you a future that doesn't exist? <laughs> As Andy Wolf says. Celebrating diversity is a use of resources in order to counter stereotypes of judgment, unjust discrimination, and often unconscious bias 
in relation to gender, sexuality, ethnicity, class, and relations among faith groups. Among faith... Once again, like I said, they've already accepted sodomy and everything else around it. This is not a church, people. This is... this The Church of England, the Anglican Church, is at... It's officially, as far as I'm concerned, an extension of the British government. Just this. I don't, this is literally what the British government pr pr like prom you know, promotes, legislates, and enforces. And then, let's look to uh, below, where it said, on, up top of Revelation 7, 9 through 10, this one's going to blow you away. This one's, I'm just going to read those two verses. And it's amazing, like, what they think, like, they, they literally are counting on you not reading, not knowing what the word of the Lord says. You'll see. It says here above that, the horizon within which a school lives and things can combine the local and the global with concern for every nation, tribe, people, and language, as stated in Revelation 7, 9 through 10. And the earth itself, on which all life depends, cannot survive without the global ecosystem and its biodiversity and then focuses on, you know, the environmentalism all that, and all that nonsense. But what does Revelation 7, 9 through I'm just going to read those two verses. This is John. In his vision. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. Does that sound like anything what they just described to you before and after this reference? saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And if you really want to get into this, I'm going to read the rest of it. Well, I'm going to go on to uh, verse... Uh, verse 14. Because he's wondering, who are these people? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, the seven-year one, under the one world system, under the beast, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all their tears from their eyes. That's literally the that's that 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 is chapter seven. Verses nine through ten is these people praising worshiping Jesus Christ, these people who were victims of the one world beast system. And Jesus shall lead them into living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. That's where the flourishing is, people. There you go. I want you to think about that. And surrounding that reference is the worship of what? The planet. The earth. And they use... I'm just astonished. They literally are counting on you not to read this. Enabling flourishing. This is life in all its fullness, and a thirst for it is at the heart of our vision for education. Is that, and are, do they mean, uh, you know, the worship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? No. Do they mean, like, even worshiping Him after being, being, being here during the tribulation? No. <laughs> being faithful and being persecuted during the No, they don't mean that. Okay, 
Next part says, within the constant clamor of the new, leaders learn that we flourish when we stop doing things, when the gardener prunes the vine. They quote, every branch that doth, that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. John 15, 2. Once again, interesting choice of the passage. Interesting choice of the passage. It goes on to say, We flourish it not for our own sake, but so that we can look to outwards and give. Let's see, what does John 15, 2 say, though? What, is, what does the few verses around it state? Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so it will be even more fruitful. Notice, dot, 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 ellipses. That's not all of John 15, 2. John 15, 2 says, oh, I'm sorry, I'm the wrong one. I'm in Luke. There we go. It says, verse 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Verse 2, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Notice what they left out. They left out, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Verse 3, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. The word I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. That is the goodness of God. God is good. With him you can do all that he desires. Without him, you can do nothing. And yet, what do they substitute for the goodness of God? The common good. A fake flourishing. Okay, let's go on to the last portion here. 4.12. Pra practicing humility, learning love. Their choice to serve others builds trust and enables genuine collaboration. Trust in what and collaboration for what? Let's find out. Unlike many other things, excuse me, unlike any many other things that we may practice, it may be unlikely we will ever master it. Meaning humility. It stands in tension with the constant pressure to be right and builds trust with teams through placing great honor on other people than oneself. While acknowledging that it is acceptable and even important to get things wrong. Let me read the whole thing. Humility causes us to reorient our desires before and more in line with God. True. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on to your own understanding. Oh, of course, then the rest says, in all your ways acknowledge him you can read this first verse, verse 3 and 5 proverbs 3 5 after your understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct thy paths so they skip out the second part for some reason coincidentally again which emphasizes his will and not ours especially the wills of those who don't believe in him <clears throat> proverbs 3 5 well Say, and then saying, while acknowledging that it is acceptable and even important to get things wrong. Uh, no, the Bible never says that. If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, ellipses, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Second Chronicles 7.14 Wow, okay, once again, let's see here. Second Chronicles 7.14 So according to this nonsense, it's okay, if not acceptable, to get things wrong. Because, you know, God's gonna... Because if, because if they humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Hmm. Notice, notice what they put. If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Dot, dot, dot. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. 
Let's see here. Let's go to Second Chronicles 714. Now they came really close. Like I said, this is one of the very few times they'll reference sin. But they water it down. Because what kind of sin are they talking about? Biblical sin? Or the sin of quote unquote Christian wisdom or deep or deep wisdom. I think you think you already hit at this point I think you have a pretty strong notion. Let's see here. Second Chronicles chapter seven verse fourteen. If my people which are called by my name my people which called by my name. So those who belong to him, those who follow him, who actually follow him, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. I will hear from heaven. That's significant, people. Reminding us where our, our trust is, where our focus is. And will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be open and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever, and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. And as for thee, if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked, this is, a, this is speaking to Solomon, and do according to all that I have commanded thee, and shall observe my statutes and my judgments, then will I establish the throne of thy kingdom according as I have com covenanted with David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man to be ruler in Israel. But if ye turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and shall go and serve other gods and worship them, then will I pluck them up by the roots out of my land which I have given them, and this house which I have sanctified for my name will I cast out my sight, and will make it to be a proverb and a byword among all nations. And this house which is high shall be an astonishment to every one that passeth by it, so that he shall say, Why hath the Lord done this thus unto this land and unto this house? And it shall be answered, Because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, and laid hold on other gods, and worshipped them. Diversity. Inclusion. Equity. And served them. Therefore hath he brought all this evil upon them. So yeah, it's not okay to just acceptable and if not important to get things wrong. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Because these are the consequences, people. Especially when you uh, decide that they're not important. They're not worth, it's not worth turning away from your wickedness. It's not worth con confessing and repenting of. Okay, practicing hum humility is not to dispel confidence and momentum, but rather ask where is that confidence placed and how secure are those foundations? And they reference Paul, who says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Well, let's see here. Are they talking about the same foundations? Once again, I guess we're seeing a pattern here, and the answer is no. And once again, what is the evidence of this? Second Corinthians chapter 12. Know the voice of the shepherd, people. Know the voice. As you follow a hireling, a thief, a wolf. Second Corinthians chapter twelve, verse nine. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. And the notice is that the whole verse again? Nope. There's still another half. What's the second half say? Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, 
that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The power of Christ may rest upon me to do what? Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. I am become a fool in glorying, ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. For what is it wherein ye were inferior to other churches, except it to be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. That's actual hu humility. Humility that allows the, the, the strength of the Lord to endure reproach, infirmity, lack necessity, pers to, to bear persecution, and just weather distress for Christ's sake. To accept the fact that you look like a fool for glorying in the Lord. And despite the fact that, and notice Paul saying, What? Well, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. Why? Because it is all what? It is all what? The Spirit. Everything I'm telling you that's good, that's true, that's beautiful, is the Word of the Lord. Not my imagination, not my wisdom. Damn be my imagination and wisdom. Or that of any man's. It's all foolishness, nonsense. Know the Good Shepherd's voice. That is abundant life. That is life eternal, my dear listeners, my dear viewers. Learning love. Learning love. We're going to conclude with this. You've listened to me long enough. I think I've said enough. Let the word speak for itself. It is a love that is unconditional and sacrificial. It is a love that envisages it is a love that envisages sorry, God not as a line manager, appraises our success and failures, but rather compassionate parent cheering on our growth. Learning love is discipleship. Choosing who to follow and who not to follow, and learning to serve in action, lurking, looking outward. This is a love that grounds great teaching and defines great leaders. And when you read through this whole thing, what kind of love are they talking about? Well, let's go to Romans 5.8. It which references, but God demonstrates his own love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And what do they emphasize? Is the love that is unconditional and sacrificial. What about the salvation of souls? Psh, that is irrelevant. The common good people conform to the common good. And guess who promotes the common good? The state. An ever-growing, centralizing world state perhaps during our lifetime we're heading that direction people we're getting closer not further away know the shepherd's voice romans chapter 5 verse 8 but god commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him Say from wrath, his wrath, his justified glorious wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. He's covered our sins, he's covered our rebellion, he's covered our our choice to to love death and to parcel out false hope fake life flat teachings 
And then let's go to Colossians chapter 3. Let's conclude with this. Let's conclude with this. Like I said, read it for yourself again. Read all of them. Know the shepherd's voice. For he will lead you the green pastures. I've got a lot to decide in these upcoming months. May I follow his voice. May you pray for me to do the same. No matter what the cost may be. Because I glory. I glory in him. Colossians chapter 3, 12 to 14. This is what it says. Does this sound like what the scripture, you know, you know described below, make, making light of the glory of the righteousness of the sovereignty of God? Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering forbearing one another and forgiving one another if any man have a quarrel against any even as christ forgave you so also do ye and above all these things put on charity which is the bond of perfectness and i'm going to read two more verses three actually i conclude with this let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. That's wisdom, people. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Giving thanks to the Father, God, and the Father by him. It goes on with family relationships and whatnot. But everybody honors one another, loves one another, forgives one another. That is true wisdom, people. That is true wisdom. When it's all said and done, that is true wisdom. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. The word of Christ richly dwell in you, that is all wisdom. Okay, we we're, 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 we're coming to an end. I just sorry, <laughs> I false flagged it again because there's actually one more concluding thing. Oops, wrong one. We don't have to listen to it anymore. We're just gonna look at one of his slides. His last slide. One of his last slides. Ah, oh, great. Yeah, where is it? I am sorry, I'm wasting your time right now. Where is this thing? Oh, it's right here in front of my it's in my notes. I'm stupid. <laughs> Forty-five fifty. Will Nope. Forty five forty, what the heck? Um a story is sustain it. Narrative is one of what what does it's fundamentally there we are. Okay, we're this coming very to simple it. question which again we draw out in our yeah, you can go ahead and pause that read what if you want to but yeah, it's, it's... require and I don't know whether you uh, resonate with this question or not it's a strange question in some ways but we've kind of put it like this what is the life expectancy like at your school clearly what we don't Oh, wait, there it is. Okay. Rich sense of living. First Timothy 6.19 So that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. I'm going to conclude with this verse. This verse. Because this is what it says in its entirety. First Timothy 6.19, perfect. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. 
that they may lay hold on eternal life. Let that sink in, pray about it, meditate on, on the word, people. Know the Good Shepherd's voice. This is Christian M.C. Fulmer. It's good to be back for the time being. Signing out.